Welcome to our first Tech Talk Live in 2021. My name is Florian. I'm going to be your host for the next 30 minutes or so. So I already apologize for maybe taking a little bit longer than our usual Tech Talk Live. But maybe it's going to be pretty exciting. Um, it's going to be a little bit more nerdy talk today, um, also with some focus on talk. Um, really quick, I'm going to introduce myself for you, for those of you that haven't met me before. I joined ARI in the year 2016, uh, being one of two core people here in Munich um, of the ARI Academy. Um, we offer training courses, um, educational program, face-to-face, -face, as well as online stuff um, for you. And we also kind of um, try to make these Tech Talk Lives and Tech Tips happen for you out there. Um, today's topic is HDE, High Density Encoding. And I'm really happy to have a few experts uh, with me. But before we really um, have them in the show, I would like to give you a short introduction of what was before, what has been before, and um, how we get to the point of HDE and why we actually use it. So let's start. Ari Academy, just a quick reminder, um, we're going to supply a link list for you guys. Um, here you find uh, a short link to our online program since we are not allowed to have face-to-face -face training at the moment. Uh, probably the online training is the safest way to meet. We all hope really to change that again and um, meet in person. I really miss that being the trainer. Um, I really live and breathe the personal um, connections and I think Ari is also a brand that relies on these personal connections. The story of HDE actually starts with Ari cameras. Um, we're, I've been photographed by Ari cameras. Um, we just celebrated 10 years of Alexa's um, kind of birthday party. So when we talk about HDE, we should briefly talk about Ari RAW. And of course, most of you are aware of that, so I'm going to really keep it short for the moment. But RAW means uncooked. Um, it's the pure thing out of the camera. Um, you all know the imagers, the image quality from ARI cameras. So what is an ARI RAW frame? Basically it's a representation of one moment in time when light hits the sensor of an ARI camera. More or less this is what we get in one frame and we store it. So the nerdy part of it, we store it in 12-bit logarithmic data. Um, that is um, kind of representing, and don't kill me if it's not perfectly accurate, but it kind of represents 16-bit linear um, information when it comes to the dynamic range and other uh, image quality parameters. So we made um, Ari Raw a 12-bit log the moment we developed it. It's an open format. It's always been open. Um, there's an SMTRD document if you want to read how you open and process it. Um, it's quite um, available for, for quite a while. And if you actually shoot Ari RAW with an Ari camera, you're going to find two flavors. Uh, one flavor is the file sequence of just a bunch of Ari RAW frames with the extension .ari. And other cameras from Ari now wrap the same Ari RAW, so there's no difference in the image quality or more or less the technical part in an MXF wrapper, which makes just one a clip per take if you want, um, while the image sequence is a folder per take with a bunch of files in it. If you actually have shot already, the post-production part of Arrow is quite established since um, we haven't changed our pipeline for a long time. Um, I would expect every post-production tool, especially the online tools out there, is capable of reading ARI raw data as it is. So there's no scratching your head how to process or develop or actually work with ARI raw files. Um, however, in the past, ARI raw was considered to be kind of a heavy format. Since it's stored in uncompressed manner, um, of course, compared to compressed, algorithms or codecs, um, it's more data. So I brought a kind of heavy example for you here. Um, if you shoot with the Alexa 65, our rental super large format camera, 
um, you're going to get uh, 6,560 by 3,100 photocytes in one um, flavor of the Alexa 65 recording possibilities. And that results in almost 6 gigabits per second of data rate at 24 frames per second. So, of course, that could be considered heavy at, certain, um, at a certain point of view. So, um, we're going to cover now the, the data part um, when we talk about HD a little more in detail. If there's anything you would like to know in detail about ARIRO in general, which might be helpful, again, there's a FAQ section on the website and the link is in the description um, available for you. To give you an idea how heavy, which flavor or what kind of flavor of what kind of camera you might handy you might have handy is, you can uh, use our online tool, the ARRI Formats and Data Rate Calculator, which, by the way, also shows you the amount of data in both flavors, the uncompressed ARRI RAW flavor or the HD encoded uh, flavor of ARRI RAW. Um, we will learn today that there is almost no difference in the usability of those files afterwards, except there's a significant difference in the amount of data. And again, if you want to figure out and get a good feeling, uh, is there enough saving if you want um, for your project, check out our formats in data rate calculator online. I mentioned the post-production tools already that can handle ARRI raw data. Um, there's also our ARRI RAW converter, which is basically the kind of graphical user interface of the software development kit that we hand out to our partners, to all the professional finishing tools. They basically use the same core um, development stage that we provide, um, at least most of them. In this tool, you can recheck um, your footage in ARRI RAW as well as in ARRI RAW HD encoded. It is a free software that you can download from our website. So just in case you want to figure out a little bit more about the adjustments that are possible within an ARRI RAW frame or all the um, metadata parts, this is the tool you want to check out. Um, again, it's available for Mac, Windows and Linux platforms and free of charge. If you haven't, so have a play with it. Really briefly, this is an um, recap of what we call ARIRA and why um, the story starts with um, our raw capture format. When we started doing ARIRA, there's a little history. The initial Alexa camera was not able to capture raw data within the camera. Um, I got my first um, raw experience already with um, a few recorders that were available back then and one of it was from Codex. So our history at ARI together with Codex is quite long. And my personal, I'm going to share a little um, private thing here. Uh, first part where I worked with Codex was on my show called Pina, a stereoscopic feature film directed by Wim Wenders. And as you see here at the blue arrow, I used uh, an earlier generation of Codex recorder in a completely different way. However, that was my first um, happening with the Codex guys and um, nowadays when we look into the ARRI world um, we had the Codex onboard recorder being one of the um, smaller recorders available back then when uh, the first feature films actually were using ARRI RAW. Extremely loud and incredibly close I think 2010, 2011 was one of the first or even the first feature film shot in ARRI RAW using the Codex uh, onboard recorder. As you can see here in the picture, it was an external recorder because the camera itself couldn't record native ARRI RAW files within the camera. Um, you see the um, SPS media slot, which was just not fast enough to capture ARRI RAW data. After that, we continued our work with Codex, or our partnership, and on the next slide, you see on the left the Alexa XT extended technology where we teamed up with Codex again and we kind of shrunk the recorder and moved it inside of the camera. By the way, that was an upgradable possibility. So if you had already purchased an Alexa camera, you could kind of um, send it in and get a more or less new camera. 
um, at least with new recording possibilities. So the cooperation with Codex, I don't want to bore you with all the bits and pieces. It continued until today. So we have a, a Codex recorder within the Alexa LF here in this slide on the right. And next to me on my desk, there's an Alexa Mini LF, which also is using the uh, Codex um, drives and the Codex recorder. Um, in the meantime, we use it not only, or from the beginning, you could always use the Codex recorders for both recording flavors, ARI-RAW or um, compressed ProRes data in any flavors. So this is just um, a recap that we have a history with Codex and um, they were willing to support us being not kind of a, a smartphone manufacturer with like millions of devices that we're gonna sell and that there you find partners all the way around. We needed someone in our range with um, reliable development and reliable hardware that we can team up with. So HDE, and I'm not really spoiling everything here because I, we're gonna have Brian from Codex here in a second going really deep into it. But I would like to draw an outline on the Codex HDE high density encoding. The idea was um, to give you another tool in the workflow working with ARI raw data. And I just want to point out a few things that are specific or special. If you compare an ARI raw frame and its HDE encoded uh, partner, as I would say, the checksums of those two files are identical. Um, so you, you restore the file basically, and then you compare the checksums, you get exact the same representation. And Brian will probably give you an idea how this works, what's the secret behind the HDE encoding process. The key feature, of course, and that is our core topic today, it, it's also the topic of the experts talking more in the workflow part, is you're gonna save um, data. That happens while you're offloading the footage. So on your Mac, you still have ARIRO data as from day one. And in the pro offload process, you enable that kind of trick. And then after that, you have approximately um, a reduction of 40% um, of the initial files. The ending or the files self itself will then have a different um, ending, so they are called .arx at the moment uh, versus .ari at the uncompressed part. And of course, it's also something that is well described. There's also SEMTI papers available that describe the HDE um, process in detail. Again, here's a link for you for further information to the Codex website, and it's on our document. So before really digging deeper into it, and before also calling Brian, I would like to show you our short tech tip video that we've produced a couple of weeks or months ago, which is a kind of really quick run through how easy at least the initial part can be to work with HDE encoding. Just make sure you have the latest version of the device manager or production suite installed, whatever you use. You connect your docs to your computer, insert your media, and basically what you get at this point in time is the uncompressed ARIRO flavor. So in this example, one frame is like 20 or 21 max. When you now want to enable the HDE encoding or the HD encoding function, just check it in the preferences. What happens is that the data on that drive will change through, through the virtual file system to ARX files. And take care, you need to have a software tool, a professional downloading tool, to offload the files because Finder will not recognize the files properly. Here is the size comparison, about 230 mega gigabytes, excuse me, versus 130 gigabytes 
when it's HD encoded in this specific example. So this is the easy part and let's now dive a little bit deeper into it. Let's do the nerdy thing. I would really like to welcome Brian Gaffney. He's the Vice President, Business Development at Codex. Hi, Brian. Hi, Florian. Hi. Thanks for inviting me today and thanks to everyone here at Erie Academy. I want to take you in today to kind of talk deeper, as Florian said, about the process of HDE and what the impact is, and then lead into some questions with our uh, guest here as well from Photochem today. I'm gonna start out by sharing my screen, and if I can just jump over to that real quick. I'm going to jump in here. And what we're gonna to do today, I'm gonna to just start off with some basic math. Um, if we take an airy raw file and we add high density encoding to it, the result is less data with no loss in image quality. So that's basically the, the basic math overview of it, but we'll get into the deeper side. But looking at some Airy Raw uh, Alexa Mini LF sample footage that is available on the um, Airy website, you can see that on the left hand side of the screen, I have a couple of sample clips that range from around three gigs per clip up to four gigs. And on the right hand side, you also can get a uh, sample HDE footage available from Airy as well. Same clips, but now HDE encoded. And on average, they're having around a 40 to 50% file reduction. So with uncompressed Airy Raw image files, HD encoding basically can save you both from the production side and the post-production side, effectively 50 to 60% of your storage because the original file size is reduced, although you've lost no image quality. As Florian said, if you were to take these original Alexa Mini LF files and do an MD5 checksum on them, and then you encoded them and then decoded them back to an ARI file, you would see that the hashes match. There's no loss in data with HD encoding, but the benefit is there is a file size reduction of almost two to one. So what is HD and why is it a solution? So Codex HDE is basically used to encode the airy raw bear, bear pattern file that we saw in that first frame in such a way that the decoded data is identical to the raw data. And it's based on a technique we call zigzag encoding. Basically zigzag encoding maps values from positive values uh, negative values, excuse me, to positive values while going back and forth. So if I start with zero, it's going to map back to zero. A negative one would remap to a one. One would remap to two, negative two to three, etc. So showing this formula example of, say, zigzag encoding, if I took a value uh, to be encoded and I applied this uh, encoding operation to it and did this back and forth comparison, what basically happens for, say, a 32-bit Java integer, you can see it represented here. The zigzag encoding process takes these numbers, which can be negative or positive, and will map them back to numbers that are always positive in such a way that the numbers are very close to zero. Uh, as a further example, you can see here, I take a, a value using zigzag encoding of negative one. And if I use this 8-bit formula of, of a byte in the two's complement mode, an 8-bit unassigned number can represent values all the way from zero to 255. However, a two's complement 8-bit number can only represent positive integers from zero to 127 because the rest of those bit combinations that represent the bit of one represent those negative numbers. And with zigzag encoding, they'll be remapped to positive numbers. So showing here a, a value of negative one going back in this back and forth process would be remapped to a positive value of one. And why that's significant is in that airy raw frame that we saw in the first uh, example that Florian showed, with HDE, we can basically take that single frame and encode it in such a way that the HDE bitstream consists of the global header from the original airy raw file, and then followed by a non-zero number of planes and parameters where we put inside of those plane parameters a variable number of rows. And each one of these rows contain, uh, contains a variable number of groups. And each group is then decoded into 16 samples. And these HDE encoded images are then packed into groups of 16 samples from that same bear pattern file. And then using the technique we described above with zigzag encoding, basically at a, at a simple level, 
Codex HDE is doing a diff algorithm per sample, comparing the frame before and the one previous in the line and doing these differences and comparing them and repacking them with the zigzag encoding process. Now, I only had 10 minutes to talk about this, but it's quite deeply explained in an open format document called Simpy RDD 51. Florian mentioned that the ARI raw file is already published as well in an open document. It's RDD 30, and this document is available online through the Simpy uh, IEEE website. So if you want to get into it in detail and learn about it, you can understand how to apply it for your own ARI raw files. So when I talk about HDE, I say it's it's a reordering schema, but it's not compression. But how do I reduce the files by two to one without doing that? Um, well, the difference is the way we do the reordering schema and the repacking of the file. See, with Codex HDE, we're not transforming the image file into a new file format like is happening with J2K. Using JPEG 2000 and image compression, a transform is applied to the image. With Codex HDE, we don't apply a transfer of the image and create a new file. Basically, we're doing a reordering schema of that bare pattern file in such a way that the file encoded is more efficient. And as a result, the original files, you know, 50 to 60% of that original file that was captured in camera is now presented as an ARX file. And although J2K is commonly used, it's led studios to archiving both the original files and the J2K files because they're not sure if there's any loss or some concerns. This leads to you know, redundancy in the archives. It also leads to confusion if, say, years later, uh, if a J2K encoder that was licensed isn't available anymore, meaning that that company that created it isn't around, then you could have trouble basically decoding your files back. We decided to publish the HD encoding format as a published open source document so that years down the road, ARX files can be treated just like ARI files and recreated uh, within the host applications. And to do that, to make sure, we published an open SDK that we shared with everyone. So we saw in a nice video sort of how this process is already done, but just to reiterate, the capture drives when mounted inside of a codex doc using our device manager software, when enabled with HDE, using a copy tool like Shopbook Pro from Imagine Products or Silverstack uh, from Pomford or Hedge or Yoyata, these copy tools will then enable the copy process. They will do the verifications, either as MB5 checksums or XX hash 64 Bs, and they will then write reports and so on in comparison to that ARX file. So once you encode them, you need to decode them. And as I said, we published an SDK that we shared with um, everybody that was creating a creative tool. And with these files that they received ARX files, they can use this formula that is embedded into our SDK to redecode the file back to its original representation. And this is the format uh, published in the actual Synthi RDD. So there's what third party applications out there? We, we had the team from Photochem today to talk about their application. There's actually you know, well over 35 applications in the market that are, are supporting the HDE. You know, Photochem is a, is a host application post partner, but applications like we talked about, like Hedge, um, QTake as well, um, small little applications from Kino and Nablet to um, color grading tools that are in, integrated into final finishing. Um, several of the post-production companies out there have integrated into their pipelines. So you can see it's a full range of tools from Blackmagic Resolve to Autodesk uh, Flame, Color Fronts, um, tools, and, and so on. So it's a wide range of tools and studios that have embraced HDE. And we've supplied, um, uh, uh, there's a test encoder as well. You can download ARX files and ARI files from ARIES site. You can also upload your own file through this test encoder online and actually come back and look at the files and do your own comparisons. So to move on, I just wanted to show some examples. So if we start to use HD, what is the impact? How fast is it to encode and decode? One of the benefits of this is it's a very lightweight algorithm that can work at very high speed. So we're able to encode at data rates from real time, 25 frames per second, upwards. And in this diagram, you can see that even older 2013 trash can Mac Pros can still, uh, you know, support the workflow at around 25 frames per second. But, you know, current, you know, hardware, you know, 2018 and, 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 and higher up to 2021 are encoding at 50 to 100 frames per second. 
So what is the real value besides you know, the fact that we can reduce the file size? Why would you want to use it? Well, the real value is cost savings. It's clear when Florian said that Airy Raw has all the benefits you know, of, of an uncompressed image, it was rather a heavy file format. And now with HDE, you can treat these files as if they were you know, a ProRes 444 file and actually get that same value of an Airy Raw file, but at the greater reduction in footprint. And that travels downstream. Your cost savings, both from a non-set configuration storage and storing it near set, could be realized savings. Uh, storing it in the cloud afterwards, you realize savings. Uh, making an LTO backup, you realize savings, and onward. So not only is the HD a cost savings for production and post storage, but it'll look, you know, it'll result in file faster, uh, file, faster file transfers and faster VFX turnovers. Plus, it's just greener to store less in the cloud. So HD is, you know, basically less is more, as I'd like to say. And with that, there are a couple of documents that you can come back and research. And um, a couple of them are related to projects we've actually done with Photochem. And with that today, we have uh, the team from Photochem that's with us. And um, some of the productions that they've worked on have ranged from Netflix shows to Disney Plus shows. Um, I wish the forces were with us today that we could talk about some of the productions they're currently working on, but I'd like to sort of turn it back over to, to John or to Freddie to talk about that. Um, let me just unshare my screen here. Is John with us today? I, I don't know that uh, John was able to make it. They, uh, they had him quite busy till early in the morning uh, with a big feud yesterday, so unfortunately I think he might uh, actually be sleeping. Um, well, this was one of the, the plus sides uh, to everyone getting back to work. Um, we have gone from a sort of a, a COVID void into a full scale production. Um, it, everywhere I've been going lately, the parking lots are full, the facilities are reaching capacity. And as uh, you were just talking about, Freddie, uh, John's doing three camera tests and productions all at once. So he wasn't able to make it today, but yet Freddie designed the stuff and I think can talk to that. I wanted to ask John and, and Florian as well, Back to my earlier slide when I talked about the workflow, if this is utilized on set, what impact is this having to your teams and the data management side on the front end? Is this slowing you down? What's what's the impact to actually apply HD into your pipeline? So, I mean, the, the front end side, there's there's no downside at all for us. I mean, we, uh, as you kind of alluded to, the, the sort of overhead for uh, ingest uh, or reading from the cards into HDE on modern hardware is, sort of invisible to the process um, and everything down the line just becomes uh, lighter weight. So, I mean, on a bigger project uh, where we're shooting, you know, uh, many hours of airy raw per day, we usually have a shared storage environment for, for publishing, for creating dailies. We have a lot of deliverables to create and, and maybe a couple of operators working at one time. So in a SAN environment, you know, that uh, contention uh, with the large files, uh, you know, obviously, uh, HD works with you know everything across the product line, everything from you know A65 all the way down to the original uh, ARI format. So when you get into those large formats, uh, as Florian talked about earlier, you know six gig or, or say two, you know what 2.7, 2.8 terabytes per hour of A65 or uh, you know 1.7 of LF, um, and all of a sudden now that LF camera looks no different than working with a XT or SXT camera in terms of your uh, storage infrastructure. It's a big deal um, when when Netflix came to us and wanted to do this project out, out in uh, New Mexico and they're going to shoot five hours a day uh, of uh, LF. It was when the LF first kind of came out on the market. We were a little concerned about how we were going to be able to upload all that content into the cloud every day. And uh, because the front end was so efficient, uh, we could just sort of push that over a one gig connection every night. And that would not have been possible with LF content. Uh, had not been for HDE. So it's the front end's just transparent for us at this point. Hey, Fred, this is Florian. May I ask you a question from my side as well? Absolutely. Um, since you're in R&D at Photocam as well, can you share your sorrows or your, 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 your fears that you had initially? Or were there any fears? And maybe sure. also, can you speak of, of the maybe fears and sorrows of your data manager DITs, if, if it might change their daily business uh, significantly? Or would you say um, this is something that after you 
have worked on several shows now using HDE, um, you can tell the people out there they shouldn't worry. Is that something you can do? Well, I'll just first say that I have a insanely paranoid uh, engineering team that I work with. Uh, everybody from our developers to our uh, uh, support staff. Um, they were all very skeptical about you know what are the ramifications of, of adding HD to workflows. And uh, you know, to Brian's uh, point, like everybody wants to save money on tapes and storage. So you have these competing, like we need to move forward and uh, we need to, uh, and, and then we're afraid of risk. So you know, early on, some of the first things that we focused on was, was building some test harnesses where we can leverage a combination of the uh, CRC checking within the ARRI uh, uh, camera system. So that if, if everybody's not aware, the camera itself does data redundancy checks as it creates frames. And, uh, and those can be leveraged throughout the sort of reading off the codex magazine process and going through image processing to, to ensure that the camera data as it was recorded onto the codex magazine is identical through the process. And then of course we you know use uh, hashing algorithms, MD5 or SHA or XX hash when we read those files and we compare those uh, after we go through the HDE process. And we processed I mean, literally millions of frames for testing until we went on the first show. So I think it was in, you know, late 2018 or something that Brian and James came to to our uh, group with a, a a guy named Chris uh, McCarroll that was at uh, Airy at the time and said, you know, this is some amazing new stuff. What do you think? And it's like, wow, I love the sound of this. Now, how do we prove that we can do this safely so I can go talk to producers and say, yeah, these cost savings are great and they're zero risk to you. And that was uh, that was a big moment for us. We have Henning here, who's running our Q and A session uh, in a, in a minute. He has also a question for you. Yeah, I would also have a question to um, to Freddie. So you are actually a um, area raw long timer. You used it since like two years time. I would like to know what kind of projects actually are using HDE? Is it only the big guys who are then saving like a hundred terabyte or so? Or is it also smaller projects like commercials and, and those kind of customers? Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's basically every show we're on now and, you know, being, you know, Photocam, you know, we, we work on, you know, we have a long history of working with independence film students, um, you know, all the way through that process. I mean, we just like Ari reaches out to do training. You know, we work with uh, with you know film students and and hope someday they might become you know big filmmakers. But the lion's share of our work is uh, much smaller projects. Everything from commercials to documentaries. Um, I can't talk about the specific documentary I have coming up in a couple of weeks. They've asked us not to discuss the titles, but uh, they're shooting with uh, uh, six hours of Ari Raw for. The most important sequence of their uh, of their documentary. Um, they're excited to shoot Airy Raw, and one of the reasons they're able to do it is because of HDE. Um, it was it was you know they they don't have the budget to to uh, to you know shoot uncompressed, and uh, you know the the option of shooting ProRes without out there, but the creative people really wanted full latitude and and finishing, so that's what HDE afforded them. Okay, thank you, and I have a second question similar. Um, somebody's asking from the uh, customers watching our show, would it be recommended to use HDE footage for archiving footage long term rather than the original uh, Airy Raw? How do you do that? Great uh, question. So in my role at Photocam, I do work with a lot of the archivists in our community. Uh, you, you know, uh, Stephen Anasazi and Brad Collar and Anthony Jackson, uh, you know, some of the, the studio's, uh, uh, you know, top people that preserve assets long term, you know, for 100 years, they're concerned with this. And, uh, uh, you know, early on, uh, we're, we're, we've been working on with a number of, you know, of course, Netflix, we've been doing cloud archive for a long while. But uh, uh, now even with our other partners at, uh, at the major side, uh, Brian and myself have, you know, talked to some of these people, went through the science with them and, and showed them, you know, tra there's transparency in how it's in encoded. You can decode it forever. Here's a document. Um, and we're actually doing uh, uh, some of the very first titles. We've completed a couple of major uh, uh, titles uh, for them, you know, uh, probably about uh, north of a petabyte of uh, HDE content uh, in the cloud. I think it's down to, you know, it's only 500 terabytes or so, uh, but it would have been well over a petabyte of source media that we've uh, encoded 
uh, and pushed into the cloud that way. So yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you, Freddie, for that. Um, what I hear from your experience, um, and that is probably something also Brian mentioned, is that there is no fear from the studio side from bonding companies uh, at all at the moment. And could you just confirm this really quick? I mean, I don't think we've had any pushback at this point. I can't say every single you know corner of the market is 100% okay. But um, now that every tool is supporting this, there's no concern anymore. I mean, early on, of course, you know, the in 2019 in the spring, it was a little bit of a different conversation uh, to get approval. We had to sort of seek approval. Now, it's more of a uh, we're using, you know, you go through these uh, calls and it's like we're using HDE. The DIT is like, yeah, I'm using HDE on my uh, Codex Vault, you know, uh, backups that I'm using as well. So everybody's happy. Um, I haven't had any projects uh, in the last year that were shooting raw that there was any legitimate pushback. Sometimes people don't know the word yet, to be fair. That you know that you have to maybe talk to somebody other than uh, the first person you're talking to on the production about getting approval. But generally speaking, there's been no pushback anymore. Right. Well, thanks for that. So even though this is a talk, um, I would like to give the opportunity to our attendees and viewers to ask questions. And I think Henning collected already a bunch of questions that we'd like to throw at you. Um, and we probably will name each person that is supposed to answer to make the switching here a little easier. Yeah, this would be a question to Brian. So everybody heard Brian. <laughs> okay. <laughs> question was, were data rates on the diagram with different computers pre or post HDE? So was it 500 megabits of array raw or destination HDE files? Um, good question. Um, the, the process itself is CPU bound. So in the end, the data transfer rate is one thing, but it all comes down to the multi-threading of the CPU processing. So besides the data transfer rate on the earlier trash cans, we had Thunderbolt 3 devices adapted to Thunderbolt 2 into the device back out over Thunderbolt uh, to another Thunderbolt 3 device. And that internal bus structure of the Mac limits throughput. Um, but in the end, the encoding itself is actually uh, not the bottleneck. In some of these cases, it's the actual drive you're writing to or the speed of it. Um, so in the past, copying off large format files to slow drives slowed you down. We've actually found that even with slower drives using HDE, you effectively can write faster because the drive now has to only write a file size half the size. So um, to go back to the question, uh, the throughput and the copying off the compact drives and the codex drives is quite fast. You can read off these docs at up to 1250 megabytes per second. Uh, again, the encoding process is CPU bound. So if you have a uh, an older MacBook with say a 2.7 gigahertz processor versus say a Mac mini now with six cores that are like a 3.2 or 3.7, you're gonna see probably double the, the processing speeds. Yeah, I think um, there's a continuous question about um, transfer speeds and rendering time and recording or dr uh, writing on drives. So Sandra, for example, is asking, um, so my question essentially is, so she's doing a, doing a two Alexa Mini Arri Raw shoot. Should we rethink using HDE with two cameras shooting Arri Raw as it will not make much of a difference time-wise, but a huge difference in file size? That's for Brian again, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a Brian question again, yeah. So did you say Alexa Mini or Alexa Mini LF, just to clarify, because the Alexa Mini uh, is another object that's not actually Codex Media, it's CFast Media. We have enabled a licensing schema where you can now enable HD encoding with that, but CFast readers themselves are, are slow, right? So um, there's the pipeline of the, the data management and then the encoding. Freddie said earlier, it's basically invisible, meaning that with this current state of the art computers, they're not really feeling an impact at all. Um, but does that answer your question or? Well, it was actually an Alexa Mini, but he has another question by Enzo coming in, which is maybe cl making it clearer. He's, he's asking what specs do we need to look for in selecting a computer for best speed performance in offloading and managing the HDE data? I can, I can probably add to that for you, Brian, a little bit. I mean, sure. obviously, 
obviously we built a lot of uh, you know systems to support exactly that scenario. Um, you know, we, we field those and we support those those phone calls directly. We we use a lot of iMac Pros. Um, you know, that it's a great machine. Um, you know, they have a lot of cores. To Brian's point about being multi-threaded. Um, you know, and to Brian's other point about the CFast cards being sort of the, the hard limit themselves, and we, we can always read, you know, what, 400 megs a second or something off of those devices, you know, maybe maybe a pinch more, and uh, you know, if you're having a really good day or something. But in terms of the HD encoding, um, it, it's, you know, essentially you're writing at 250 or something, you know, uh, 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 from those cards. So there's no penalty for the read off the card. We can max out on that. Um, and uh, I haven't, I can't say I've tested that on a, a older uh, style uh, 2013 Mac. Uh, we we uh, wouldn't probably try to do it on that platform. Um, the the, the uh, even a new Mac Mini would be a Intel based Mac Mini would probably be a better platform with Thunderbolt 3 for that use case. Um, but there's but the uh, there's no uh, and, and then in terms of transcode hits. Um, in a you know perfectly optimized storage solution, when we use like SSD SANs uh, for reading the media off of those things, so th there's no storage bottlenecks. Um, we take maybe a, a, a one or two percent hit on the transcode speeds for the decode overhead. It's it's not even a factor in the real world. Our transcodes are actually net faster because uh, read contention is probably a bigger challenge for us on a big project with many files. So our uh, the the pressure on our storage goes down for reads with multiple machines. So it's it's there's no downside. So here comes a question to Florian. <clears throat> Actually, it was a I meant this question to send to John, the DIT, who is still sleeping, but Florian is awake, so we <laughs> give it to him. So given somebody would be a non-experienced HDE user or an HDE non-experienced user. So how would he get information? Where to find that codex page, array page? How do I get information how I shall use the system? Well, um, we, pro we will provide the, the direct links on to our uh, information on the web. The RRO FAQ section has a, a detailed section also on HDE. Um, and also you find the link to the codex web page um, where additional information in case studies will be found. However, I can hear also from the questions in the chat, there are a few um, people really um, keen on digging deeper into it with like really specific uh, specifications. Um, first of all, I would like to tell you um, if your question might not have been answered here in a very detailed way, feel free to send us an email. Um, we will provide an email address at the end of this event um, to recap if, if we couldn't answer it yet. Secondly, um, as we learned, I can only give you a very common answer to, to that question. First of all, the um, algorithm that HD is using, as we learned, is based on CPU power. So in a nutshell, uh, the faster and multi-threading power of the CPU is what kind of nails the performance uh, up or down. So of course, you can use um, any machine, so it's compatible with even your older machine, but I would recommend just to do um, a test. Um, the Codex Device Manager is uh, free of charge, so you can take your camera, record some ARIRA sample clips. Um, usually with the camera you have a, a dock, and please perform your uh, tests yourself. Once you enter this domain, you also should be a little bit skilled in, I call it the IT world, so for example, on, on a notebook or on the computer, on the Mac, you have different buses. So you have a few of the IT backgrounds or let's say limitations that you should be aware of. Um, for example, I call it load balancing. If you have one bus to read fast, you have to assign the other bus to write fast. And then of course, there's a lot of discussion which media can be used to write to. So that if your bottleneck is maybe the drive you write to or the RAID or whatever you have, um, that kind of give you wrong numbers. So be prepared if you haven't done it um, yet for a little bit of testing, but it's, there's, no, there's no miracles or there's nothing you can do with a little bit of IT background and a little bit of testing. So I really encourage you to do that. Okay, here comes another question to Brian, please. <clears throat> so he, um, Maximilian is asking, is Codex and the whole HDE platform still only Mac-based? 
Are Windows and Linux any option in the workflow? Good question. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that device manager is what enables the uh, codex high density encoding, and that is only a Mac based application. So in the case of it, like an area Alexa Mini, we do allow that reader to be mounted in Windows, Linux, or uh, Mac, and you can you know copy the files onto it. But for HD encoding, it is Mac based only at this point. So you can utilize is a, a PC. However, in that last step we were talking about workflow, I think a, a Mac Mini connected to your docs is just an ingest tool to point to your storage as ARX files, and then you say open up your PC with color from to resolve and point to those files is a, a very efficient workflow as well. So you don't have to switch your whole platform onto the Mac just to enable this. Uh, if you look at a, a Mac Mini as just a gateway tool to ingest your footage to your storage, um, it's a fairly low cost investment that you would pay back quite quickly, which is the savings and the storage. Okay, then there was one question again. Uh, I think this could go to Freddy. And the question was, um, if the files are encoded to HDE, do they have to be reconverted or decoded for post-production? I think we answered it a bit, but maybe you can elaborate. So if something is in the archive and comes back and you want to recut a film or so, what to do then? Yeah, I can't. I can't speak for every tool out there. I mean, as I said earlier, most tools support ARX files directly now. Um, sort of within the next lab, you know, universe, um, ARX files are just transparent and they're decoded on the fly, going through our uh, image processing and compression engines. So, for example, uh, if we're doing visual effects polls or conform polls, um, and people submit a request uh, through our automated system they uh, hit our back end and uh, and just read the native uh, ARX files and then convert those on the fly into EXR files or uh, whatever they need to be created for uh, finishing or for, for visual effects. Um, that's that's a you know pretty important that was an important part of the pipeline. Yeah to, just to clarify that so the decoder that we published does not actually turn the ARX file back to an ARI file within the application thus requiring you to have more storage say on the color end it treats that ARX file as the native file and it's decoded right within the native application because they have actually you know, embedded in their applications the published SDK. Like NextLab, same with Baselight and Flame and Nuke and um, you know, all the color finishing tools resolved. It took us uh, about a year to kind of build those partnerships up and that was maybe the slower migration adoption back in 2018. But as of 2019, I think we had a bulk of the tools out there there are still others that are still coming on uh, within their pipelines, but I'd say we 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 cover ninety nine percent of the you know commercial applications in the market today. Cool, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you very much, Freddie, for supporting us and sharing a few insights um, on HDE in the real real world. Um, thank you for most of the people that. Um, ask so many questions. Um, we have to look at the time a little bit at this moment. Um, it was great to do that nerdy talk, I have to admit. It was um, one of the most nerdy talks ever on the Tech Talk Live. So thanks for attending and thanks for supporting us. Thanks to the whole team here in the studio to make this happen, the Workflow Group and the R Academy. And for those that maybe chimed in a little later, the video will be available on our YouTube channel later on. Again, if there are any further questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Maybe you can separate a little bit the codex part and address them to the codex people directly, or of course, we will forward them. Um, and the are questions, of course, just send to the address we're gonna supply to you after that. So, Another successful um, evening here in Munich, another good start in the day in Los Angeles, gentlemen. Um, thanks for helping out. I hope you have your uh, first successful HDE show coming soon. Fingers crossed, stay healthy and see you again. Bye-bye. <laughs>